So today I'm, I'm just going to be talking uh, about a, a project funded by the European Union through their interreg program called Bespoke. Uh, and this, this is a collaborative project with lots of different organisations from uh, across the North Sea region. So we've got a mixture of sea companies, uh, universities, advisory organisations, so, so quite diverse. Uh, so I'll just move on to, to what we're actually going to be doing and uh, give you a bit of background about, about the project. So as you can see, uh, this map on the right shows the potential for pollination. And this was worked out given the sort of habitats that there are in the landscape, how far the bees can disperse and that sort of thing. And you can see there's a, there's a, the red is, is the poorest. And as you can see, a lot of the uh, arable areas of the of the UK are pretty poor in terms of pollination. So uh, lots to do. Uh, and also we know that from naturalist data on where bees and hoverflies have been found that that uh, the number of areas that they occupy is, is also declining for, for many species. And this is, you can see this decline here, it's a paper published in Nature. Uh, but there are some upsides. So some of the common bumble species are, are doing really well. Um, and that we think is in response to all the agri-environment measures, particularly the wildflower mixes that have gone in. Um, but there is potential there. So crop yield can be uh, enhanced and the quality of, of the crops as well. And uh, for beans, that can be anything between 15 to 30% by having good pollination and even higher in uh, drought periods. So uh, lots of potential there. And of course, many other crops are pollinated, mostly the fruit crops really important. So strawberries, top fruit, um, and so lots, lots to do and uh, lots of potential. So the rationale for the project is pretty simple, really. If you've got uh, a big crop that needs pollinating and you haven't got many bees, sort of sad, lonely bee trying to pollinate this whole field, but if you put in some wildflower areas, then we know this encourages pollinators and you can hopefully get better yield and better quality of the crops. And so we're trying to achieve this through a, a multifaceted approach. So we've got some research going on and uh, one of the key elements of it is to try and develop some more targeted seed mixes uh, to support the types of pollinators needed by each crop type. So in the uh, UK, NIAB AMR are working on uh, wildflower mixes for fruit crops and I'm working on uh, looking at field beans. Uh, and to go alongside that, we're also developing techniques for actually measuring pollination. So it becomes, we're hoping to be the standard practice. So simple techniques, you go out, measure pollination, and hopefully know if it's, it's adequate or not, and then decide whether or not you need to put in some remedial measures. Uh, we also have some sort of cost benefit uh, going on there and trying to work out whether, you know, it is worthwhile to encourage pollinators and what are the barriers to, to adopting these techniques. And then there's some modeling going on because it's always difficult to know how much habitat to put in place. So then the modeling is going to try and work out how much area you may need on a farm to encourage pollinators and also identify regions that, that need improving uh, based on working more on that map that I showed earlier. Then hopefully if we can come up with lots of new ideas, then they will feed those into our green environment policy and hopefully get better support for pollinators in those. And then of course, there's a lot of outreach going on. So we want to demonstrate best practice. So there's some demo sites being set up particularly in fruit crops at the moment with uh, East Morning. Uh, and we'll be running some uh, training programs and we've already produced some guidelines. So simple ways of, of encouraging pollinators on on farms. And so we've got a few outputs already. So we've produced a few guides. So there's one on how to uh, successfully establish uh, perennial wildflowers areas. So some top tips really, very simple, uh, hopefully uh, good best practice. And you can download that from this website here, uh, northsearegion.eu forward slash spoke. There's also a guide on actually how to uh, identify some of the main pollinators and how to record them if you're interested in doing that and also a more specialist guide on common bumblebees of the UK if you really want to get into it. And that's actually seems like it's you know it's a bit too much but actually it's quite important when you consider field beans there's really one uh, species of bumblebee which is the key pollinator and that's the one you want to get on your farms for beans and uh, 
so it's good to know what it looks like. And this is some studies we did last year. What we had was eight farms, and we were trying to see if there was a, a difference between uh, hand pollinated, and t in other words, maximum pollination, and then what actually happens uh, on the farms to see if there's a pollination deficit. And you can see for, there's quite a variation across the farms, but you can see that some of them have uh, you know, almost 20% um, pollination deficit. So if they'd had better pollination, they would have got you know, a, a bigger yield and possibly better quality of uh, bean seeds as well. So there is potential there. Uh, and uh, we think this is worth looking at. And if you think what the response might be to uh, you know, agrochemical product controlling a pest, you might get a 5% yield response. When you put that in context, then it it's, does seem to be quite important. So the, the project has got another couple of years to run. So we, we are uh, looking to run events once uh, COVID restrictions are, are lifted more. Um, training events on how to measure pollination and, and how to uh, get wildflower habitats established and that sort of thing. So if you're interested in any of those, keep an eye on, on, the, uh, on the website and also the Facebook page, which has a, a lot of more of the sort of daily stuff that's going on. It's worth a quick browse and we'll be updating that constantly with, with new things as they come out. So, so that's me for the moment. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, John. If you could stop sharing and, and then I'll um, um, we'll come back to questions in a little while. So uh, the, that's the bespoke program and, and the reasons for it and it, the length of it. Max, I'm going to turn to you from Syngenta and you're going to talk to us about Operation Pollinator and Green Headlands. Thank you very much, Phil. Uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Yes, uh, so I'm Dr. Max Newbit from Syngenta. Um, and I'm talking on behalf of a, a wide scale project, but focusing on a small segment of it today uh, from uh, ourselves. Uh, in the UK, this has been led by uh, Belinda Bailey and I help out technically. So just to, to put it into context, um, this initiative, Pol uh, Operation Pollinator, um, it primarily focuses around trying to improve and enrich the environments in our environment, uh, sort of agri-environments. Um, and you can see on sort of screen there what's been sown over the last six years in the UK. Uh, I think in total we're at about 50,000 hectares being enriched since this project started in uh, 2014. But it, it, it hasn't been a sudden thing. We've actually been doing this since 2001 when we started the Buzz project. And this, this was a UK uh, specific project within Syngenta. And it was primarily looking at how we can enrich uh, uh, agri environments and understanding where best to place uh, flowering margins, what timings, positionings on farm was best. You know, like John has already mentioned, it's a uh, help with pollinations. We've looked at all seed rape, fruit, and veg, uh, cucurbits bits in specifics. But then as time went on, it evolved to a larger global project. And that's where Operation Pollinators come in. So this is a, is a global initiative now. And we've had a target for a five year period to enrich 5 million hectares worth of uh, agri-environment. But we actually went far beyond that, surpassed it. We, in that five years, we did 8.3 million hectares of enrichment. And it was through the selling of uh, floristic margins, as you can see on screen. Now in the UK, we primarily focus on annual mixes and you can see the sort of four main ones there. Top left being an annual flower mix, very floristic. Uh, top right, that is our bees and seeds mix. So that's both for pollinators, but also for bird feeding species as well. And then what I'm gonna focus in on today around the IPM element is our green headland mix, which we have as a brassica and non brassica version to try and maximize uh, its usage on farm as much as possible. Now we've done a lot of work around this because one of the, the things we want to do with Operation Pollinator is not only subsidize the cost of the seed, which when we were doing uh, the buzz project was always coming out on top of the biggest blocker, the cost of the seed and getting into these schemes. So we, we basically make them half price these schemes to get into. Um, but we also want to show to the grower and the end users that it's giving a real world benefit. So this is just a snapshot of a, a three year report we did on the Green Headland Mix where we went several times a year and did sweep nesting and pitfall trapping on farm in these mixes to understand what benefits we were having to uh, the ecosystems, obviously primarily uh, the invertebrate area. And you can see on screen two charts on the left, that's looking at the number of uh, specimens, individuals, and what category they fall into. So obviously 
generally the bug and beetle population is one of the largest, but you can see there we are also uh, finding a large amount of bees and pollinators and butterflies. And then for the IPM piece, obviously what we're quite interested in is the spider, hoverfly, lacewing, as well as parasitic wasp species we're finding in the mixes. And then on the right hand side, that's just breaking down then into how many types of species, so species diversity is within those numbers. But that might look quite plain, but what I want you to do now is feel quite sorry for the ecologist who's been helping us do this over the last uh, several years, because we've actually uh, had over 100,000 specimens, individual insects identified and speciated during this study. Uh, and we know that over 99 species have played a role in some form of pollination for their life cycle. And then obviously what's key quite today around the IPM piece is that we know that 140 or more species within what we've sampled has uh, been a predator or parasitoid. Now, this is what led us to do quite a lot of work around the green headland mix, which was originally just to be a mix around root vegetable headlands. It was an opportunity mix to go on where bare headlands would be. So it was put in place to hold the soil and improve the soil. But as time went on, we did a lot of work around actually what could it be doing it's on top of that to do benefits to uh, plastic grow. Plastic. Um, so part of that was one, understand the species. Uh, we also know nothing in the mix. It's things like phacelia, uh, oil radish, uh, buckwheat, and clover. We know that that doesn't sort of perpetuate any of the viruses we're worried about. Because if we're thinking about the crops, we're thinking about potatoes, carrots, aphid transmissible viruses are one of the big issues. And one of the things we found is as long as you do more or less a six meter headland, you can act as a potential viral filter, but on top of that, the predator species that might penetrate the crop. So we've done quite a lot of work around that. And on the screen is just what we found, what is in a grass margin in red comparatively to the green headland. Now, very different types of margins. One is a long-term habitat, but not very floristic, whereas obviously ours is highly pollen rich. So you can see on the left-hand side of the dotted line, sort of what the numbers, individual yeah. number counts in the margins right. would be, spreading to bees, hoverflies, beetles and bugs. And again, the beetles and bugs come out strongly, but they do favour a uh, very much a monoculture system. Whereas what we want to do is propagate, obviously, the pollinators, but hoverflies in particular are a good indicator species of predation, potentially. Uh, and so that could be potentially acting as your IPM reservoir. And then if you just sort of break them down on the right hand into their sort of functioning parts, are they a, does a herbivore which might encompass pests? Are they a pollinator species or a predator species? One, we're increasing the number of pollinators uh, in these margins compared to just grass headlands, but also our pest to predator ratio is greatly uh, increased. Generally, we get a three to one pest to predator ratio, which initially sounds bad. So you're getting three times as many pests as predators, but you have to remember predators can eat up to 120 times the individual number in prey. Also, we've been making sure that we understood what the pest numbers are, and generally they're non-major uh, pests, they're minor plant bugs, etc. They're not uh, big aphid populations, they're not carrot fly. So overall, we've been very encouraged by this. But we wanted to understand if you make these uh, headlands, how far will these pests, um, well, primarily the predators, penetrate into the crop to act as IPM. Now we did a, a series of trapping from the headland into the field 25 meters 50 75 and 100 looking at both pests and predators but also what do pollinators do what do generalists do and you can see the headland huge volumes of uh, biodiversity there not surprising because that's the food source but as soon as you get into the field 25 meters you lose 90 percent of the biodiversity however we do get quite an even number of pest and predator numbers through the field uh, and this in this year 2019 was primarily hoverfly so they can be acting as a uh, a beneficial input into the field, but they will drop off rapidly. That's not necessarily a bad thing because we've known previously most aphids will be landing in through the headland and then penetrating the crop. So overall, it should still act very well. And we have done work to understand, you know, how much does it affect viral impact in the field? And all the work we've done has been on standard practice farms. So this is really IPM, it's part of the program. And visually on screen, you can just see what the biomass difference is between having biomass collected in the headland comparatively to a field with a headland and then a field without the headland. Very noticeable differences. And we also in this year, uh, although relatively low virus year, we did have a 70% reduction in yellowing. We have done it in other years and generally we have seen a difference, but 
you know, we always want to prove firstly that it didn't cause more problems than it was beneficial, because that's usually the first rebuttal to something like this mix is that you might bring in uh, pests, but that really isn't the case. And when it has had a benefit, it's been noticeable. So overall, we see these as a very good part of the IPM system. And that was really just my piece to say, you know, from our point of view, what we want to do is encourage uh, ecosystem, encourage uh, predator species, because really that will be an aid in the future to um, uh, programs going forwards. Thank you very much, Phil. Yes, thank you very much indeed, Max. And um, so we've heard so far from John Holland talking about the Bespoke project, and Max has talked about Syngenta's part and uh, the role they play in Operation Pollinator in Green Headlands. Uh, I'm going to turn to Neil, Neil Evans now from the VI and ask Neil if you just expand on the Be Connected project. Uh, so are you there, Neil? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Thanks very much, Phil. Okay. Yeah, we're fine. Okay, great. So thanks very much for that, Phil. Um, so today I'd just like to sort of run you through and tell you a little bit about Be Connected, which is one of our, our initiatives that we've had running there for a couple of years. And firstly, what is Be Connected and why did we need, find the need to, to, to develop this, the scheme? Well, currently, uh, best agricultural practice is, is basically advocated by the UK Code of Practice on Pesticide Use and also through the farm assurance schemes. Um, they require notification takes place when certain crop protection products are used. And in, this, in the case of Be Connected, it's obviously insecticides. Um, so the actual code of practice stipulates that um, growers should be giving beekeepers 48 hours notice of uh, impending insecticide application. But there's a bit of a problem here that, you know, in an ideal world, the farmers and the beekeepers would be, and the spray operators would be talking to each other directly anyway, and there wouldn't be a need for any alert scheme. But in the real world, it doesn't really happen you know, which can lead to some suspicion and distrust on both sides. And so we sort of, um, you know, beekeepers see farmers spraying and instantly think it's an insecticide, whereas, you know, in actual fact, it could be liquid fertilizer or, or even water. So we sort of, um, th there is a, a system out there, the spray liaison officers, um, when a decision is made to spray, uh, in the olden days, you had to find the spray off liaison officers number, ring them, they then had to get the message out to the local beekeepers of a spray event. And the farmer and the contractor didn't really have any idea whether the message had got through or not, and whether the beekeepers were aware that he was intending to spray um, an insecticide. So the old system was complicated, inefficient, and too reliant on one person. And we really needed a system that let beekeepers know quickly, didn't take too much time, and was instant and easy to use. So we... Uh, we took some advice on this. We had meetings with the NFU who insisted that any such system should have anonymity, which was essential, uh, and only to inform you know, beekeepers and people who needed to know on a needs to know basis. And similarly, the British Beekeeping Association, they, you know, they said that they needed instant information of what was being sprayed, uh, will the chemical affect the bees, and obviously the date and the time. And, you know, what we, we sort of came up with this system that we thought would be the best for both parties. So we developed Be Connected, and it's basically using uh, up-to-date modern technology, enabling farmers to notify neighboring beekeepers directly. Um, it's a simple web-based platform that basically uses Google Maps to do the actual um, scientific bit of, of making the connections. So to put things simply, Be Connected was developed to provide a new and improved way of doing something farmers and beekeepers have always needed to do, and that's to communicate. So I just thought I'd quickly run through the system and show you how it actually works. Um, so you enter the, the web page, and the farmer can set up a, a registration in about two minutes. And then from that initial registration, so adding spray treatments to actual fields is about three to five minutes. So, oh, skip one there. So basically, uh, this is what the, the sort of input page looks like for farmers. Uh, you input uh, the, your postcode, which basically takes you to a location near your farm. Um, oh, why is that gone? And 
and uh, and then you input the crop that you're growing and you also tell it whether that field contains a flowering margin because uh, obviously that's going to attract bees and other pollinators and that's it you cl click on update and that field is developed um, setting up a spray event is really simple you put in the event date you tell it what insecticide you're intending to apply and which of the affected fields hit submit and again that's it so here you can see that for this farm we've got three fields registered and down at the bottom there the spraying event uh, which I set up for tomorrow and as you can see it's already found that there are five hives in range for that particular spraying event. So similarly for the beekeeper again registration is really quick and simple it's just an email address and a password uh, within three to four minutes they can map all of their hives Again, using the simple system, you input your um, postcode to get fairly close to your location. And then you can click individual fields here, um, like where the, the big uh, pointy red arrow is. And also um, for the beekeepers, you can tell, you can set the spray alert distance from, um, let's let this person in, from, uh, from um, the distance from your hive. So you can set it, I think, from uh, one kilometer, three kilometers or five kilometers. And it's interesting that bees sort of tend to forage about five kilometers in a day. So hit the submit button. And again, once you've set up your hives, we've got uh, four hives registered here. And you can see for each one of those, uh, not surprisingly because they're all around my house here, <laughs> and uh, which is about a kilometer from where I set up the field, you can see that spraying events are planned for those hives. So if you click on the spray event, it then takes you through and gives you some more information. As you can see behind here, uh, it gives you the spray date, the distance from the hive, what's being sprayed and whether there's a flowering margin and also the pesticides that are being used. Um, but what the system allows you to also do is that you can use this little thing we call bee mail here and you can anonymously contact the farmer to find out exactly what time the spray will be applied or what, which field in particular it might be applied on uh, or which direction you know in terms of where the the hive is is uh, is sited so it's a sort of all singing all dancing system which is really simple to use and um, simply put the decision to display is just four clicks later from the notification to complete local beekeepers are aware of the event and can react and the farmer and contractor is aware of beehives in his area and can also react and you know, perhaps in terms of an IPM decision, you might decide that a spray is not needed after all. Um, so, so far, just a few numbers. Uh, just let this person in as well. Uh, we currently have 4,430 hives that are registered across the UK, and we have 8,044 fields that are associated with uh, those hives. Also, just to say that uh, another feature of, the, of the, the website is that it allows you to literally print off a certificate that you can then use. Uh, it forms part of your IPM plan. I think we'll probably speak about those later. Um, and the certificate can be used as evidence to demonstrate compliance as part of uh, Red Tractor and other assurance schemes. So I think that's all I wanted to say. Uh, it's a really simple and effective system. And I look forward to taking some questions. Thank you very much indeed, Neil. Um, now you'll have to um, remind me whether or not we've managed to get Robert on the phone. We haven't managed to get Robert on the on the um, on the on the screen, but we have got him on the phone. So I just need to ask Robert to speak and see whether uh, you can hear it through my computer, literally. Robert. After, afternoon, Phil. Can you hear me? I think we just about can, Houston. Yes, we can. <laughs> So uh, you look like you're on the space station, Robert, but far away, we can hear you. I was on another call, which was um, booked a long time ago, and I didn't think it was going to happen. But really, uh, I'm a farmer from Staffordshire, um, right near the um, urban fringe of Birmingham, Sutton Coalfield, and that sort of area. Um, I am a beekeeper myself. We've currently got... Um, eight hives dotted around the place, two with bees and a hollow tree full of them, which I'm trying to get to migrate, but, um, but like most things, uh, uh, being largely, they, they don't want to do what they're told bees, they do what they're sick. Um, but 
think really we need to talk about um, operators and the key to this is the operator. Now, as part of your farm assurance, you are always asked if you know the name of your local beekeeper. Um, but I'm not sure if the operators always know the name of their local beekeeper because sometimes they aren't the ones that do the assurance. So there might be a little bit of a gap there. Um, uh, operators are all very highly trained um, and you try to keep them updated. They have to undertake a lot of training courses, particularly for handling chemicals and in the use of the machine they're operating, which can be anything from a boom sprayer to other types of applicators in the field um, for various specialist crops. So about a dozen different types of tests they can take depending on the machine. And I mean, I used to grow potatoes and I'd probably have to have about four different machines in the cab with me for putting uh, chemicals on, nematicides on, um, powder for uh, ward off evil spirits. I used to think it did, but my agronomist assured me I needed it. And that was all part of the rules we have now for spray operators. A long time ago, if you were born before a certain date, uh, which Phil probably qualified was, you, you had a granddad exemption, uh, but that was done away with a few years ago. So every spray operator is trained. We also have to have our equipment tested. Now, there is a European scheme, but the uh, British scheme goes far in excess of that. And our sprayers have to be tested annually, uh, an MOT. And this is done by the National Sprayer Tested Scheme, which come to the farm, test the sprayer, um, go through it with their operator. And it, it's a very good learning experience for people um, to learn the intricacies of their machine. Um, they're quite complicated bits of kit. And they, um, if you take plumbing, put it on a boom and move it around the field with anything from eight to 12 kilometers an hour, you can realize that there are issues that arrive in a year and we try to teach them to maintain it. So that's another aspect of um, the operator and they themselves have to belong to a thing called NAROSO, which is National Register of Spray Operators. And to be on the register, they have to an annually take um, continuous professional development. Um, they have to achieve a certain number of points each year. Um, you can sign up for a year or three years. I, I renewed mine yesterday for the princely sum of £78 for three years. And I got 40 CPD points, so my, my performance has been above expectations. Uh, but we occasionally do get some operators that haven't quite achieved their points. And this year, with COVID, it hasn't been the number of events that they could um, take part in and gain the points. But we have an annual training event which went online quite successfully. They're around about, Neil would know better than me, have about 20,000 um, trained operators in the country. And really the final thing, you know, who, who polices all this? Well, there are many things that uh, check on what we do, but the largest one would be the red tractor operation, farm assurance, which checks that spray has been tested, operators are trained up to date, um, an agronomist is used um, for both fertilizers and sprayers, and checks on all the things that we have, margins around the field, lee wraps to protect the margins, and look at where washing has been put on and talk about um, the, you know, do you know your local beekeeper? So that's a very rapid run through with the requirements for spray operators. And alongside that, a lot of consumer operations have, um, you know, their own scheme, you know, has to grow potatoes from the canes and they have their own requirements. Some cooperatives, provide um, major manufacturers who do baby food and things like this, and they all have their own protocols, which examines what people do. So I'm trying to imply it is a highly regulated industry, 
and integrated pest management is a major part of the future for our operators. So that's a quick run through, Phil. I don't know if there's any questions. Yeah, there, there will be. Sound. There will be a few. I, I don't know whether you'd like to take yours now, would you, Robert? Probably. Before the phone dies. <laughs> so, um, Robert, I'm quite interested uh, in IPM, usually is associated and, and uh, the, the terminology with advisors and managers. Um, but obviously, operators play a really important part of putting that um, product on the field. How, how important is it that operators keep, keep up to speed with uh, th those things that they can affect? Um, well, we do undertake annual training. Um, it is sometimes they do question what they're being trained on. You've got different operators. You take somebody like me, who is the farmer, who talks to the agronomist and um, understands what's going on. And on some other units, you know, the man may be presented with a bit of paper in the morning which says put product X, Y and Z on fields A, B and C. And they wonder sometimes why they're being told this because they aren't part of the decision-making process. But, but in their annual training, we try to impress upon them the need for integrated pest management to think about what they're doing and to consider some of the effects. But it, it must be a bit difficult for someone to sometimes challenge the, the, the paymaster's decision. And I think we appreciate that, but we have a continuous education process going to, to educate them and bring them up to a higher level. Uh, and, I, and I suppose the sort of things that will, will have to be considered from the operator is is things around the choice of nozzle and spray drift and what the weather actually is like on the fields that they're going and spraying on on the day when someone else might not be present and also things around transfer systems would those be the sorts of things well we have a number of concerns one would be bystanders um which would be you know if you've got a public footpath through your field you have to be very careful not to spray over it um, try not to spray when there's somebody around and if you can imagine with COVID considerations people are walking more in the countryside um, the, the handling of the chemicals themselves for the operators as you say closed transfer systems where they don't have to tip um, five litre or 15 litre cans in, into a reception hopper which increases their safety or is, is a thing for the future um, and, and generally, where they put their sprays in the machine, you know, a very small drop of concentrate on a concrete yard, followed by a quick shower, puts a whole lot down in the drain and into a stream. And, and we have to be very conscious of those sort of issues as well. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thanks for the moment, Robert. We'll, we'll try and come back to you if we, we, we keep the line going. Um, if I can ask Max and John to turn their cameras on and... and um, We'll have some more questions. Um, the first question is me being a bit mischievous, and it's really to John. Um, and, and John, just for, for the people that uh, have, have tuned in and, and joining us today, really just stressing the importance of pollinators because and, and crop pest predators and stuff. I mean, can't we just continue with less? I mean, what, what, why, why, do we why do we need as many and why do we keep encouraging more? I mean, I've got that a little bit, you know, playing devil's advocate there, but perhaps you could allude why they're so important. You're on mute as well, John. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's many reasons, uh, not least that we're going down the route of more IPM because of uh, pesticide resistance, uh, but also insects seem to be on the decline generally. And so we do need to be doing more. Um, and I think the two go hand in hand, the IPM and the insects, because they often share the same sorts of resources, so especially the floral resources. So what's good for uh, bees can also be good for some of the pest natural enemies. So it's a bit of a win-win there. Um, and we, we can do more on the farm. It's not just about sowing wildflower habitats. There's all sorts of other habitats out there that you can do things with. So how, them, how you manage the hedgerows and making sure they have a chance to flower. Uh, having a nice understory in woodland, grassland management is also important. We know that pollinators rely heavily on the resources provided by hedgerows and for uh, extensively managed grass fields. 
So there's lots of opportunities. Um, and then, of course, the, the impact on the, the crop quality and, and the yields is very important for fruit crops, less so perhaps for the arable crops apart from field beans. Um, with all seed rate, they tend to be wind pollinated, so less important there. So um, just to, turning really more to bespoke, um, what were the sort of seed mixtures that you're, you're, you're looking to develop and, and investigate there? I presume these are flowers or uh, of some sort. Yeah, I mean, one of the main group of pollinators in some of the fruit crops are the solitary bees. Uh, and they've not really been catered for by the current agri-environment measures, so especially the early ones. So the original pollen and nectar mixes, which are mostly sort of legume-based, are really good for long-tongued bumblebees and the ones which pollinate field beans, but not so good for the solitary bees because they need a sort of simpler open flower. And so we've been developing some seed mixes for to encourage solitary bees that could be incorporated uh, and just identifying the types of plants which are robust enough to be included in mixes now they're going to succeed because uh, there's nothing worse than spending a lot of money on seed and then not having the, the plants come up so it's trying to identify those ones which are you know sort of banker plants that could go into a regular seed mix oh, okay thanks very much john max um Turning to Operation Pollinator and the Green Headlands, I mean, are these mixes that you're talking about, framing fields, are they long-term, are they annual mixes? Um, so so what, what we focused on is um, annual, currently annual mixes that can fit in on farm around with a rotation because it, it, that's part of the issue when uh, potentially expanding area is that you want to have something that works on farm, is quick to establish and acts as a benefit. So. The green headland mix was definitely an annual mix because what we were trying to do, we were working with the root uh, veg rotation. You were being opportunistic on those bare headlands, putting it in. And originally it was for soil retention and soil improvement because we had a, a wide array of plants that did different things with their rooting. But then obviously it became apparent we could get those side benefits of beneficial insects, pollinator improvements that we have spent actually the last sort of five years really looking into. Uh, the rest of them have been similar where what we want is very uh, active annual mixes that are very potent, very populous in flower number, seed number for the birds as well. Uh, most enchant people talking about insect numbers related to birds as well. So there's that part, but also the seed production is very key for overwintering. Um, and what we find is that when we look at the what we're finding and what's happening with habitation, they're very much being used as a food source, short-term shelter, they're very uh, transient, but what they're doing is helping support the wider ecosystem. Because when we've done the studies, it doesn't matter what your field is, what type of crop, what it matters is the margin itself, but also, I think as John's alluded to, it's that wider land use around you. Because when we've looked at our farms that we've had in these uh, trials, when we've looked at the numbers, the ones that are most biodiverse with species and individuals have always been the same one. And that's because of what their surrounding land use is. And it's is this thing it's yes these margins are good that we're promoting but i think john's absolutely right headland uh, hedgerows forests understory um unfortunately depending on where you are in the country and what the land use generally around you is that has a huge effect but what you can do to enrich and encourage it it's a long-term thing that we need to keep on doing this and keep a relatively high proportion of land use in this to have a beneficial effect okay max now just before i come to neil because there's a lot of questions on be connected in there and Max, just a general question on, on um, why a company like Syngenta, who, who you know, were renowned for producing chemistry to help us with uh, food production, why, uh, you know, and plant protection products, why would it, why does Syngenta want to get involved in, in things like Operation Pollinator uh, and Green Headlands? Uh, well, we're, we're, it's a very good question. Um, and obviously, I'm a, an R&D member on a panel of independents, really, but what it is, is that you're a company that's working and operating in a system and you want that system to be healthy and sustainable. It's sustainable in two ways. One, obviously you want to have as minimal impact on the environment as possible, but by consequence, by doing these measures, we're gonna have a healthy and sustainable farming system long-term, which obviously for you know, commercially talking, that is what you'd want as a business. But it's really putting our money where our mouth is because we're, this is a financial loss, this uh, operation pollinator, because what we want to do is have a beneficial effect on the system we're highly involved with. And, and that's why we're doing it. On top of obviously 
we want to, and as is things in the wider business, everything we're doing now is you don't just look at a product, you're looking at the total system. How does your cultivation affect uh, weed or pest control? How do floristic margins help? How does a cover crop interact with pest species? Does it mask it from the pests that you're worried about so that you can grow them in tandem? How do all these different things operate? It's not purely just how does a chemical operate anymore, it's that farming system where the whole industry is moving to IPM. And I know we've said, talked about how does how do you track it? How do you get more uptake? But I think with the direction of travel, it is inevitable and is growing. And I don't think people actually realize how much they're already doing. It can always be improved, but this conversation just needs to continue and develop as time goes on. And, and from my own experience, um, you know, the cost of seed and, and projects where subsidized seed come in, it's often a hurdle for people going into the first place. And Syngenta have helped with that, haven't they? Yeah, so that, that was really what the, the buzz project that started really found. You know, we were trying to figure out what the blockers were and what we could do to help establish these and, and manage them to get the most out of them. But when we did worked with uh, different growers and did surveys and, and researched it, the blocker was fun. You know, everyone wants to do it, but if it's financially limiting and it can't actually be affordable in your farming business, you can't, it's just not sustainable from the economic point of view. So if you alleviate that barrier, the uptake goes up dramatically. Thanks. Okay, Max. Now, Neil, I'm going to turn to a, a few questions for you because you've probably seen them in the chat room. But the, the first one was really around um, communicating between farmers and beekeepers and really what actions beekeeper, beekeeper, beekeepers can take if, uh, you know, there is an, you know, a spray that's either going to be put on. What sort of actions can beekeepers take? Yeah, well, the, the system was set up so that, you know, as, as long as the beekeepers are actually informed, then they can, um, you know, take evasive action either by, um, you know, because um, it is possible to actually close the hives off so that the bees are unable to leave the hives. Or if that was not possible due to the design of the hive, then they could actually move the hive if necessary. Um, so that was that was one of the things. I mean, I saw the, the comment about, um, you know, the, the number of, of farmers and beekeepers and uptake and that's a really interesting question Lucy, from Lucy at Leaf I think it was um, and we we are, are getting there slowly we're increasing the numbers of both farmers and beekeepers on a sort of a, an annual basis uh, and we're, we're aiming to sort of increase that um, sort of exponentially we're looking at various different ways of perhaps doing that but it's actually very hard for us to to fathom out the total number, for example, of beekeepers, because um, the the only database I think that records beekeepers is um, a database called BeeBase, which is I think run by Ferrer up in uh, up in York, um, and I think there's twenty four thousand beekeepers registered on that. But again, it's it's a little bit like us and the farmers. It's who's actually registered, but how many of those are actually active? You know, they could have been historic. Um, and the other problem that we have with beekeepers, of course, is that, you know, keeping bees is, has suddenly become quite a sort of a trendy thing to do, especially with lockdown. And, you know, there are those sort of um, uh, sort of not part time, but, you know, these those people who are sort of hobbyist beekeepers, if you like, who may not, for example, be part of the bee fraternity. You know, they might not be part of the uh, beekeeping associations. So it's, it's a real tricky one to sort of try and understand the numbers, actually. So I, I quite like the, the bee fraternity and bee mail you mentioned earlier on. Um, yeah, yeah some, some, some good use of the word bee in those things. So um, another question, Neil, was around, um, can farmers record other habitats? This is from David Whiting, such as hedgerows, fallows and winter food plots. So could, can they enter them? I, I presume they could because they could call it a field, could they? They could. I, I guess if they registered it as a field, then yes. And, you know, as long as they recognise it, just themselves as, as being a hedgerow or something like that. But um, yeah, we don't actually have the facility within Be Connected at the moment anyway, uh, to actually to, to actually do that and register it as a hedgerow. You would have to use the notes part of the of the page setup to, to make that note for yourself. But I mean, it's 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 slightly inflexible in that it's it's basically a geographical tool. Um, I think another one of the comments in the in the chat was, um, can it take into account wind conditions and precipitation? Uh, and no, it doesn't actually at the moment. So that's something that we might look at for the future. Um, but at the moment, we if if a spray event has been set up and 
then it isn't actually done or the chemical isn't actually applied because of a change in the weather. It's still up to the farmer at the moment to actually go back into the system and to update that themselves and to, to basically cancel that event. So, so let, let's just take that point, Neil, in the fact that, that I, I know from certain distributors and, and, and indeed Syngenta as well have had in the past, have had their weather forecasting systems and, and um, from other distributors will have conditions when to go spraying. That might be an opportunity to link that information on wind and precipitation into the Be Connected app. So the farmer can actually give much more accurate information. If he is delayed, mm -hmm. uh, he'll, be, he'll, he'll generally be showing a, 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 a time in a period when for, for all intents and purposes, there's a green on the traffic light system about conditions which are fit to apply plant protection products. Yeah, no, that's true. And we are actually in the process of looking at developing possibly a, a farmer friendly app um, for Be Connected, um, which, you know, might be able to actually incorporate some of those features and, and for, I don't know, for example, take a, a feed from the Met Office or something like that to incorporate that kind of information in the future. Okay, and, and final one really on, on for you, Neil, is around the extent of which this notification system is, con is uh, Compulsory. This was a question from Roger. Yeah. I mean, it's it, it's it's, it's uh, as far as I understand, it, it's not actually compulsory, but it is set out in the code of conduct for the sustainable use of pesticides. So it's it's uh, it's something that um, you know the industry looks on as as being good practice, basically, and it's set out in there that it should be forty eight hours to give beekeepers time to to move or close hives if necessary, um, but. As we all know, with uh, UK weather conditions, uh, I'm guessing that you know 48 hours is perhaps a bit of a long period for most far farmers and growers to to consider. And, and and Robert, are you still on the phone? He is. I'll just have to turn him back on speaker. Hang on. Yeah. Sorry again, uh, Robert, Robert. I, yeah, Robert. I presume as as a farmer and a beekeeper, you see the bee connected from both positions. Um, how do you, how do you find? Um, I mean, I presume you're sending B-mail to yourself, are you? <laughs> That's right, yeah, yeah. I, um, I, I think, I, I, well, I just spray at a time when the bees won't be active. It's quite easy when you're on your own farm, on your own place. But when you're um, a larger farmer with lots of units dotted around, it's very, very difficult. Um, you know, it's not very easy to move a hive of bees because unless you take them a certain distance, they come back. Um, but you can't stuff up the entrance with a bit of newspaper, which probably can take them a day to chew their way through, and things like that. So it, it's much easier to do it. You know, they, they like it to be warm, so they won't get going very early in the morning. And, you know, once it cools off at night, they're back in. So there is a good window there for spraying products. And it's quite good, actually, because we know the wind usually drops at night as well, and there's less chance of drift in other areas um, so yeah it's, it, it can be done yeah so it, it's really a matter of um you know spraying in the middle of the day often it's too hot you know a day like today probably spraying it was probably too hot to spray in the middle of the day off and it's also when the our pollinators are, um, are their most active so being selective about when you spray is a really really key message that, that is i mean some of the products don't behave very well when it's hot um but uh, yeah, just on, on various pollen mixtures, it's great to get expert advice on this. But, you know, I'm eight years into a scheme and you're locked into putting something on it, which probably would be um, not the done thing at the moment. But every time we sow what we're supposed to sow next year, it's totally dominated by clover. It just seems to thrive on our farm and take everything, uh, choke out everything else. So in that case, I might just turn to one of those experts, John, and uh, just say about that particular issue. Um, you know, I presume clovers are probably quite good for bumblebees, but not necessarily good for everything else. How, how do we get, what about the management of these habitats so that we, we get variety, uh, we keep them weed free and not dominated by certain species? Yeah, it goes down to getting the establishment right in the first place. So picking the right location, um, not too fertile for some of these wildflower mixes, making sure you've got a weed-free seedbed if you can. So having a fallow period and cultivating and really getting rid of the weeds in the first place is always a good idea. Uh, not putting them where there's already a good supply of noxious weeds or something that might invade quickly. Um, we tend to recommend sowing in the autumn these days. 
because of the dry springs. So you've got a bit more chance to, to get something going. Uh, any time from sort of late August, September is ideal. Uh, and then, yeah, cutting them in the first year, standard sort of management practices. But I think also the, the choice of seed mix is really important, um, getting that right balance of the species in the mix. Uh, so if you know that clover's taking over, then perhaps put less of it in the seed mix would be the obvious thing to do. Uh, perhaps look at some different clovers, if there's one in particular that's that's dominating if it's red or white or perhaps look at some of the other ones crimson clover or and they can you can spread the actual flowering period over by picking a variety of different clovers as well uh, so thanks. lots of options there yeah, yeah. thanks john and um, max just a, a question here about how long after spraying will bees be at a risk i presume one of the answers will be it depends on the product but i, I mean I, I would imagine that Reading the label as well will we'll, we'll give it. Read the label or contact the manufacturer. Say if you contact ourselves, we have guides. Uh, we can provide PDFs on on when to spray, what not to mix with, and a few things to think about. So um, that it will be on the labels, but also ever in doubt, always contact uh, either your local representative or hotline for one of the manufacturers. Now, now Neil, there's a cracking suggestion here from Ed Bradley, who said, could the Bee Connected award environmental points? or star ratings for farmers and operators. These could be used towards Neurosa or basis points. So uh, uh, you can nod your head, because I think we both agree that'd be quite a good idea. Um, um, and that's something that, you know, possibly could be in the new iteration of it, could be an idea to get more people to be engaged with it, uh, to sort of follows on from Lucy's points about, about uh, how many people are taking up and re-registering their fields. Yeah, no, no that's a really good, it's a good suggestion from Ed Bradley. Um, I'd just like to point out is one of our VI champions. So thanks very much, Edward, for that. And um, yeah, no, it's a brilliant idea, isn't it? And ob obviously um, everybody likes a little bit of financial incentive as well. So perhaps we could offer some, you know, discounted um, annual training events or something like that. To, to yeah, help. so so the, uh, the comment that I would make, Ed, is that you get the star rating for the farmer today. So thank you very much indeed. Just a couple of questions, because I'm conscious we, we've probably got about five minutes left. And, and this is really is, is a question uh, to all of us really is, is around the importance of IPM plans. So I believe, Neil, there's been some new plans, IPM plans out, which give a bit of a, a scoring or a metric uh, of where farmers are on the journey. Can you just allude a little bit more on that? Yeah, sure, I can. Um, yeah, I mean, the old IPM plans have been around for, since about uh, 2014. And, um, you know, to be honest, when they were first introduced, they were the, one of the criticisms was that they were perhaps um, little more than a sort of Excel spreadsheet tick box exercise. So what we decided to do last year uh, during lockdown, actually, with uh, our NFU friends was um, we took a piece of research that had recently been published um, by um, a very nice chap called Henry Creason. And Henry, I, I saw that you'd registered for this. I'm not actually sure if you're on the call, but if you are, um, a shout out to you. Um, but basically, Henry did some, some research um, a few years ago now um, across the whole of the UK, but also in Ireland looking at um, factors that uh, prevent the uptake of IPM uh, across arable systems, basically. And he used uh, not only sort of um, agronomic uh, factors that were, that, were, that were sort of investigated, but also he looked at it from a societal sort of um, approach. So, you know, what were the sort of things that were preventing people? I'm just going to turn Robert off. Hang on, because he's making lots of noise. Um, uh, to to you know what were some of the barriers that were preventing people from from trying new things and you know perhaps doing sort of um, evaluating what they were currently doing and whether they could do things slightly better. So we used this paper that Henry published as a sort of template. Um, it was based on a questionnaire uh, which had about twenty four questions. I think there were in the original questionnaire. There were six of those questions were core questions which Henry had worked out. A scoring system for and basically if you ask those questions every year from using the scoring system you get um, an individual score for the uptake on of an individual on farm uh, in terms of how well they're doing IPM on a scale from zero to 100. So Excellent. it sort of makes it quantitative and so what we're doing is with new IPM plans we've incorporated that into them and we can then look if whether people are improving on a year-to-year -year basis. Okay, thank you, Neil. I mean, a good, another good suggestion there from Paul Beach about can be connect, B 
be connected, be linked to gatekeeper and muddy boots types of systems. So anybody on this call who, who might be able to talk and from the VI, that would be great for the industry to be proactive about awarding points for environmental star rating and getting it onto uh, computer systems to show the industry is moving forward with IPM is a great idea. Right, I'm, I'm gonna wrap it up with the final question now. And this is around, um, uh, and I'll, I'll start with Max really here. And this is about how important it is to keep talking, communicating and being proactive. You know, not only just from the industry side, but to show government as well that, that, that the industry and, and, the, uh, and the wider audience here is talking about issues around plant protection product use. Max, how, how, how important is it for us to keep communicating? Oh, well, we're, we're, we're in doing um, a lot of work around this because it, it's about being consultative, isn't it? As an industry, we want to be progressing constantly. And everything we've said today is, is a snapshot of current advice and information that's been produced and projects. But it, it's going to be ever evolving, um, as is uh, the issues we face. So this dialogue needs to be always there because things will change. Uh, there'll be different advice coming out. And hopefully what that means is over time, we'll have better and better systems in place to help provide better habitats for biodiversity. We'll have better plans for IPM and it will all integrate into what will hopefully be a, a very sort of unified system with everyone on the same page and we'll get maximised, you know, for the growth of the yield and quality uh, from the environment, we'll get uh, the least impact and hopefully, if anything, we'll have um, a more resilient and uh, bountiful uh, amount of biodiversity in our uh, farming uh, ecosystems. Thanks, Max. And John, just a final word from you, really. Um, if, uh, how, how important for you as, as, as someone who does work in the research arena, but practical research, is it to get your work and to show what you're doing to a collective audience like this? Yeah, I mean, this is a wonderful opportunity for me, but we have to remember uh, insects really are declining. We've been monitoring them at the GWCT for 50 years. Last year was our worst year ever. Uh, real rock bottom numbers of insects. Uh, this year is not looking much better. So insect declines are with us. So uh, it's, it's okay in terms of being fewer pests around, but it also means it's less food for birds as one of the participants has said. So yeah, we do need IPM and we need it pretty urgently to, to work. Okay, thanks very much indeed. So I'm unfortunately our time is up. But we, we could probably go on for a little lot, a bit longer, but um, I'd just like to wrap up by thanking our speakers to, to uh, Max, to John, to Neil, and to, to Robert on the phone at Mission Control. Um, and, and, and you know, some key messages there. I quite I did like the B fraternity and B male. Um, I also did very much uh, think there's some mileage in the environmental points and star rating and the importance of IPM plans. But John really picked on a key point there that I think we should all remember there in, in when we are addressing these issues out in the field and, and in the way we go about uh, the way we farm is about the decline in insects and we really have got to do as much as we can to help them. So I, I hope you found this uh, conversation useful. From the VI's point of view, we we want to show a, a proactive industry uh, uh, and showing that we are taking these issues seriously and developing best practice and best decision-making processes. Um, Neil, I don't think we've got any other questions. I think we can probably wrap up by saying our next uh, um, webinar is on the 28th of July. Now, we, we had one a month ago on water, but we're now having on the 28th of July, we're specifically having it on one on saying, let's talk all seed rate, IPM, seed site and sprays. So really getting ready for a new season, a new crop, and delving deeply into uh, the, the IPM progress we can make around all seed rate. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, we hope that you'll all sign up and join us next time and uh, have a good evening. And I hope the weather's nicer, a barbecue, maybe a, a, a drink or two as well. Bye now. <laughs>